Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and we're here to preserve and promote culture in this benighted age, one weekly conversation at a time. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memory Show through iTunes or by plugging our RSS feed into your favorite podcatcher. You can find the RSS feed on our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. We're also on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on Spotify, YouTube, and TuneIn.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell a friend, give it a mention on your favorite social media platforms, and go to the iTunes store, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. It might just inspire Apple to promote us a little. You can support the Virtual Memory Show and get access to exclusive content with a recurring monthly donation via Patreon. Just visit patreon.com slash vmspod and set up your level of support. You'll get new material from our patron-only blog, and you'll also get to listen to my quarterly bonus podcast, Beer of a Square Planet, which features extra material from our guests and is only available to supporters of the show. So visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and... Help me continue to produce smart conversation about books, art, comics, and culture every week at the Virtual Memories Show. Before we get into the update, here's a reminder that I'll be interviewing the cartoonist Seth at the Strand Bookstore in New York City on May 7th in support of his new collection, Clyde Fans. The event starts at 7 o'clock. Visit their site, strandbooks.com, and look up the events calendar to find us. You'll need tickets if you plan to attend. They're free, but you still need to register. Uh, Seth and I have done two one-on-one -on -one episodes already, so I'm looking forward to uh, interviewing him in front of an audience this time. Okay, so it was a busy week for me. Uh, Monday, I went down to D.C. in the afternoon uh, where I had dinner with an old friend who's going through a big life change and that kind of, you know, conversation took up all of our evening. Tuesday morning was a breakfast health care meeting with a senator and then a train back to New Jersey where I went straight from Newark Penn Station to a business meeting with a prospective member of my trade association. Uh, Wednesday was work and sort of catching up on Monday and Tuesday stuff. And and then Amy and I went to the premiere of The Man Who Killed Don Quixote, which was just wonderful and a great idea for date night. I emailed Tara Gilliam's daughter afterward to tell her how much we enjoyed the movie. Uh, she's one of the producers. And I'm also letting you know that because I want you to know that I have Terry Gilliam's daughter's email. Now, Thursday, a uh, morning drive to Philadelphia for a trustee meeting and then a pharma trade show in New Jersey and then back home. Friday, late afternoon meeting with one of my member companies in New York, followed by an amazing dinner with them at, at Gabriel Kreuther uh, near Bryant Park. They were paying. Uh, Saturday was a podcast in the East Village with next week's guest, Frederick Tutton, which elongated into brunch and a visit to the gallery where Frederick had art on display. Um, you'll hear about that next week. Sunday, Amy and I took our greyhound, Bendico, to Wawayanda State Park for a hike, and I threw in a two-mile run on top of that. Um, all of which is to say, it's been a busy-ass week. Uh, the clients I saw Friday, they were just amazed when they found out about my extracurricular life on top of all the stuff I do for the day job. And they actually apologized for having me in New York on a, a Friday evening when they discovered I had to be back there 12 hours later for the podcast. But I told them, don't worry about Saturday. That's what I do for love. And this evening, our meeting and then this, this dinner is also really important to me because you guys are based in Japan. We don't really communicate much. So getting to see you in person is very important for the job and for making sure I'm, I'm doing the things that they need done, um, which was nice. Uh, the CEO of the Japanese company uh, spoke in Japanese to the manager who was also there, who then said to me, he says, if you look up gentlemen in the dictionary, there would be a picture of you. So that was nice. And seriously, the dinner was insane. Gabriel Kreuther, 42nd Street, north of Bryant Park. Uh, prefix dinner, absolute knockout. Anyway, none of that is background for this episode, except 
that time management is really important. And that's regardless of whether it's for artistic pursuit, work, the weird hybrid of a life that I have, family, of course, that you have right in the middle of all that. And this week's guest, Michael Carroll, goes into some of the, the juggling that was necessary to write his, his brand new collection, Stella Morris and Other Key West Stories, which is published by Turtle Point Press. I met Michael last December when I recorded with his husband, Edmund White. Ed mentioned that Michael had a book coming this fall, so I asked if they could get me a review copy, if he's interested in recording with me, and it was affirmative all around. Um, that said, I had a little trepidation going into this one. See, I only saw Michael briefly that day that I recorded with, with Edmund White, and my impression of him was shaped less by that than by a section in Ed's new book, The Unpunished Vice, about Michael. Um, he sort of goes into their, their courtship, goes into Michael's writing life, his frustrations in it, sort of how their social lives and artistic lives differ, all in a way that I was kind of expecting someone who's a lot more prickly than the guy who greeted me two weeks ago outside their building for this podcast. Um, and we sort of get into that issue, the way people get rendered on the page by other writers in their lives, um, because there's also a Edmund White character in Stella Maris, as well as a Michael character with um, different set of interests or different uh, circumstances, I guess. Stella Maris, I want to say, by the way, is a really good collection. It's it's primarily about, well, gay life in Key West, where there are permanent residents and vacationers, and it sort of centers on this, this queer compound uh, that Michael calls Fantasy House, uh, where just about anything goes. But it's it's a really uh, interesting and intricate set of lives and characters that he creates. Michael shows a lot of affection for Key West, and he brings the he brings the characters to life when, on the surface, they may seem like kind of standard suburban or, or middle Americans, uh, or very decadent gay men in the middle of Key West, but all of them have a lot more going on underneath, as well as the straight people in their lives and the the ways their lives extend in history and, and in each other's stories. And the stories intertwine and, and characters overlap uh, from one to the next. But it, it culminates in that, that sort of fictionalized version of the relationship between Michael and Ed, and that um, that sort of goes into the way we translate our lives into art. Now, I do want to note, to date, I have not appeared in anyone's books, and I'm happy to keep it that way. I've shown up in the acknowledgments of a couple, which is always disconcerting, but I don't think I've been fictionally um, transmogrified yet. Anyway, um, one thing to keep in mind, uh, Stella Maris is set in Key West, and it is very much about gay life and gay sex. I used to publish Samuel Delaney's work, so I'm used to graphic depictions of gay sex. This book wasn't shocking to me by any means. Your mileage may vary. Uh, Michael has a very funny anecdote about that in the middle of um, the, the episode where he's doing a public reading from this book. But I enjoyed Stella Maris a lot, and I'm glad Michael found a home for it. And I'm glad that home is Key West. As caveats go, um, there was a weird static fuzz on Michael's channel, so I had to try to remove that, but in the process, it makes his voice sound a little hollow. Uh, also, he wasn't close to the mic, but I was afraid to give him much direction because I thought he might be a little um, uptight about the whole circumstance of sitting down with a guy he doesn't know and, and recording a conversation. So um, you might need to listen in a little or uh, increase volume some. I didn't want to jack it up too much in terms of gain, which would cause other weird audio artifacts. This is all production type stuff. I'm sorry to, to launch into that. Anyway, here is Michael's bio from the flap copy for Stella Maris. Michael Carroll's debut story collection, Little Reef, won the Sue Kaufman Prize for First Fiction from American Academy of Arts and Letters and was shortlisted for the Lambda Literary Award for Gay Fiction and the Publishing Triangle Award. His work has appeared in Ontario Review, Boulevard, The Yale Review, Southwest Review, Open City, and the new Penguin Book of Gay Short Stories. 
Originally from Jacksonville, Florida, he is married to writer Edmund White and lives in New York City. His new book is Stella Maris and Other Key West Stories from Turtle Point Press. And now, the Virtual Memories Conversation with Michael Carroll. How did Stella Maris come together for you? I, I saw an interview where you'd mentioned that some of the stories were a bit older mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. you basically, it, it seems, you wrote the others in a, a big hurry. What was the yeah. process for this in terms of writing it and in terms of getting the stories sort of overlapping and intertwining? Yeah, well, you and I were just talking about uh, writing. Uh, having discipline and actually being able to write or not having anxiety? <laughs> Because I'm filled with time constraint. Oh, okay. Time constraints create discipline. So what happened with my first book, Little Reef, is that uh, Ed, my husband, the writer Edna White, came home from the hospital after he had some strokes, and I needed to find a way to write, and I wrote most of Little Reef in a bar. I would make dinner for Ed and a friend, whoever was going to come over that night, and I would set it up and then I would go write in a bar during happy hour. Mm-hmm. And um, so Stella Morris itself, it's a similar thing. Uh, I I did not plan, just like Little Reef, I didn't plan to start my career with a book of stories and I didn't plan to write Stella Morris. But after Little Reef, I was writing some stories that are now very old, four stories that are quite old, including one from a novel that I've never published. It's a chapter that I've made into a story. And then last year, 2018, in January, Ed and I were in Key West. We go to Key West every year. And uh, a friend of mine asked for a short story for an online magazine, and I wrote it very quickly. Mm -hmm. The first three are very short. They're 14 pages. And, um, And then I just kept writing them. So I wrote them like most of them I wrote like in four months. The first five stories of the eight I wrote in four or five months. And then I got the encouragement, and this is so key, so important for writers. I got the encouragement to revise them because an editor wanted the book. Mm-hmm. She read the rough of it, including the, the last three stories. One of them she asked me to kick out. There had been four. The last three survived from the old times. And so... Uh, you need encouragement is what mm-hmm. you need. Yeah. And I had that and I had the freedom and the time and it's all because I really love Key West. And there was a time when, when I was not in Key West or when I was in Key West and I thought I'll never be able to come back someday. I'll never come back. And that was tragic and horrible. So really the book is a way to save Key West in my mind and my life. In other words, to stamp it as a place. Mm-hmm. Do you feel in terms of fixing it in a time? Although some of the stories do flashback, not mm-hmm. super specifically and extensively, but is it a particular moment of Key West you're trying to... No, I think for me it's like an eternal moment. You yeah. know, it's like it could be 20 years ago or 40 years ago. Um, the stuff about Trump and everything just happened. Mm-hmm. I would mention Trump. I would mention a political thing. But it's undeniable if you walk downtown... You, you go you go near the anywhere near the port anywhere near Duval Street and you see tourists and you think that person probably voted Republican, <laughs> <laughs> you know. Yeah, well, that's true. You, don't live, <laughs> you don't live like I do out in the uh, suburbs where people had lawn signs and it was a you know a clear indicator that they called chum. Yeah, it's called chum. Yes. <laughs> Here in New York City, I kind of doubt there's a whole lot, a lot. Of, of you know people no. putting signs in their windows right. back then. So, but also I feel close to QS because I'm from Jacksonville, Florida, and there were only two newspapers, like city newspapers, that uh, went pro-Trump editorially. And Jacksonville, Florida, the Florida Times Union wrote, "This this man is what we need," and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. You know. So I think maybe a lot of it was an urgency and a reaction to what was happening around me. He had been in office for a year. And as you know, the the stories have a very sexual nature. And to me, the, the libidinous nature of what I'm doing 
it's sexually, it's kind of a reaction to the political outrage I'm feeling. It's like, it's a little bit like masturbating. I'm like, you have to get it off your chest. Yeah. yeah. Venting in, in, yeah. Yeah. in erotic terms. Uh, but tell me about your Key West. When did you, when did you first discover it? And sort of how has it changed for you um, over time? I can't say that it's changed as hugely as it has for Ed, my husband. But I first went there, I think it was fourth grade. My parents and took my brother and me on a cruise to the Bahamas from the port in Miami. And we drove just for the day down to Key West, not even an overnight. And I remember looking at it from the car. And it was my father was like this all the time. Well, there's not much to see here. It's like, well. Yeah. <laughs> I think I became a writer because my father never wanted to get out of the car. <laughs> <laughs> That's a question I have for you. But yeah. <laughs> he just didn't want to go. I don't see anything. I remember once we went to New Orleans where I was over the weekend just now. And the most famous thing about, one of the most famous things about New Orleans is you got to have breakfast at Brennan's. Um, I guess it's on bourbon or Royal. I don't know. And, um, and I said, I don't really want to have breakfast at Brennan's. And my father was like, do you want to go there, Brenda? She said, I don't think I have to. She was, we were always worried about money because it was the 70s and it was inflation and the oil crisis. And, uh, and they said, well, they would give me the money the following morning to go the following morning and have breakfast at Brennan's. But I, I was 12 or 13. I was reading Capote at the time. And, and I got there and they weren't open. So, so what I'm saying is my father was a spoiler of everything. He was just like, he, you know, he wanted to have fun, but you know what he wanted to do? He wanted to get as close to that first beer of the day as possible. And for him, driving and beer drinking obviously didn't mix. He just wanted to get back to Miami and have that first beer. I'm pretty sure that's what it was about. <laughs> I'm not saying he was an alcoholic, but I'm not saying he wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> I shudder to ask, only because it's not explicit in the, the book. Um, well, we'll say first, did your parents support you being a writer, or was your homosexuality enough to alienate you from your parents, and the writing thing never really paid into it? I have to say, overall, they did. Mm -hmm. My mother, we, we didn't produce any, any kind of artist in my family, except my uncle my father's brother had done some painting before he became an engineer because he had a family so he wasn't going to become a painter but um they were nice about it my mother was very nice about it i was in the peace corps i was overseas and my mother would write me and she would always call me her hemingway and all this stuff yeah. they were nice about it but <clears throat> the worries about money the worries about having enough to save for old age i think is what always that there was a line drawn at some point. So it's a good thing that when I went to graduate school to get my MFA, I was able to do that without paying tuition. Where'd you study? Bowling Green State in Ohio. And mm -hmm. I think the two most famous um, people that they produce is the novelist Carolyn Forche, mm -hmm. whom you should probably interview because she's fascinating. Her memoir just came out. Your name's uh, familiar. It may have been from researching you or... Uh, maybe. I don't know. Carolyn Forche has written a... She's a poet, but she's written a memoir about her time in South America during the times of the assassinations. And, Jeez. Uh, Look her up. Is uh, she New Yorkish? Or Alfred? She's in... I think she's in Fairfax, Virginia or somewhere in Virginia. Yeah. But she'll be coming through New York, I'm sure, to promote her book. And so she was the first famous one. And then the next famous one is um, Anthony Doerr. And he's tremendously successful, and and he's a he has a beautiful personality. He's got a family, and he's somebody for whom the whole thing worked out pretty darn well. <laughs> yeah. And and then the next most famous one is my college boyfriend. His name is Patrick Ryan, and he's a short story writer. And he wrote two. Co he's from Florida as well. We went to FSU together in Tallahassee, and um, uh, he said two collections of short stories about uh. A family that has two gay brothers, which is kind of an innovation. Well, I, I did one uh, an episode with Lance Richardson who did the biography of um, the House of Nutter, 
uh, the the two Brit- well the British Savile Row uh-huh. guy and his uh-huh. brother uh-huh. who uh-huh. were right. both gay, right. born right. in right. the right. late forties, right. and and Ed had blurred it, but. He's a blurb slut, as we know. That's so. right. right. Well, that's good. that's yeah. because we have, we have a friend in common who really urged it upon him. Yeah, yeah, it's a really good one. <laughs> it's one of the few from last year that sticks with me in, in you know interesting ways. In fact, Lance has stayed in touch and suggested, uh, uh, as I guess I'll be recording with soon, uh, Hugh Ryan, the guy who did yeah. When Brooklyn Was Queer. I haven't uh, met him, but he seems wonderful. Yeah, book. The, the yeah. book seems neat. I just started it a couple of days ago oh. and thought, okay, th- this is clearly going to be a fun conversation. So, you know, I hope... I hope it's not as horny as my book. I really need that. I need to stand out in some way. Did you feel um, it was erotica in that respect? Because it's not. There's not enough sex scenes for it to, to warrant. You know, in my book, erotica, erotica. Yeah, in my book. Yeah, I don't know if you use if you words if you use yeah, well, well, if yeah. you use this language, you know, yeah, then it suggests something, right? But did you feel that was, well, part of the goal? In terms you know, of Ed and I were in Mississippi last week. We were, at a, uh, we were at a conference. The conference for the book, it's called, in Oxford, Mississippi. Really wonderful. And I looked up at, during my reading, and I saw the crowd, and was reading the, the, the title story. It's called Stella Mara, Star of the Sea. And it's about a retired couple. Um, and the man is gay, and the wife always knew that. And I looked up at the audience, and they were all retired couples. <laughs> and I just, I just, I, I just immediately started cutting out the little sex. I mean, just like little sentence about sex here and there. But I also, because I'm so passive aggressive, that I said, "I want you to know, I just cut out the sex." <laughs> I'm sure they appreciated both parts of that. You right, know, right. I didn't have to hear it, but I know it's right, right. so reading the room is important, I guess. When you have a reading you know, the room, yeah. Hey, now there you go, reading the room. That's a good title. See, I'm, I'm always I'm, thinking about titles. Oh, I'm I'm king of the title and the one paragraph, which uh, John Crowley explained to me. Gil, you know, that's why you have to write a story about a guy who only comes up with titles and first paragraphs, and then, then you're fine. You'll finally get over this thing <laughs> little does he know it's <laughs> so it's john crowley the guy who wrote the lake effect or? no no uh the novel little big oh uh, yeah, 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 yeah 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 of course and um the egypt cycle right. um but yeah we met through the cascade effect i was telling you about when i, I got here just a guest yeah. who introduces you to guest my career is more of the butterfly effect but okay yeah when weird thing <laughs> happens and all of a sudden oh my god it's oh, happened. yeah oh heck <laughs> I don't want to curse on your podcast. Oh, heck. oh please. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's one of those. Uh, every so often someone says, is it okay to curse on this thing? <laughs> really? Uh, you know, I always tell people, don't worry, no one's listening. So it's, <laughs> <laughs> I'll so, curse in the George Carlin way. Yeah. Remember the seven. You have your seven dirty words. Right. Um, we mentioned that a couple of times. Did you ever think you were going to be married? Yes, I did. Okay. Um, two quick things about that. I always had girlfriends in junior high and high school mm-hmm. when I was five or six, uh, I was in love with my uh, dentist's daughter, Mary Lane Pace, in Sweetwater, Texas. And um, uh, I was, but of course, I, I always knew that I needed to be married to a girl because that was the way we were shaped. It was like very post Baptist, and that we still went to churches that resembled the Baptist, but they weren't Baptist because my parents wanted to drink and dance. But um, did you have those Jack Chick comic? Track oh, I up. saw those every summer in Memphis. They oh. were originally from Memphis. I would see them in churches all the time. Okay, we, we had these Baptist neighbors in sure. New Jersey all my sure. life, and sure. she used to, as a Jew, I needed to have my soul saved, so she would drop these these tracts on us, not realizing all they were doing was inspiring me to read more comics, which mm-hmm. were really more Satanistic than than you know anything else that was going on in my life. But anyway, so you had girlfriends. You were no, you said you said that you're a Jew, and the, the thought about that is that. In the South, we don't say Jew because it sounds pejorative. We're so passive aggressive. We say he's Jewish. Yeah, and I, I, most people here use it too. I like to throw Jew because it's right. abrupt it sounds, and it just cuts it, sounds it off. Like and, a, like I'm a, a Jew. Bullet. I'm not Jewish. Right, I'm, right, 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 right. right. Jewy. And then the other thing about girlfriends that I think I would get married is that uh, recently I saw an old uh, boyfriend, a uh, man, young man friend we never dated technically from college, and. He said, well, yeah, what happened? I mean, why didn't we ever get together? And he was the most beautiful guy at, on, on campus. And I said, you have to understand that I did not know how to be romantic with a guy. I've been having sex since I was very yeah. young, but that wasn't the same thing. Yeah, you know, you the, the actual, bifurcated mind. Yeah, the interaction yeah. and, and the moments in between sex, I guess. Right. Is that what you... But I never had sex with a girl Yeah, because it wasn't right and I, 
wasn't secure about that or anything. No. I never even cupped a breast or anything like that. <laughs> I'm not taking notes like a therapist, just making notes for... You know. <laughs> right, right. Is it ever that you were borderline? Yeah. <laughs> when you mentioned, though, the, um, the that title story with the, the older couple who, yep. with the, we'll say, closeted husband. Um, yeah. Closeted to most of the world, not to his wife. Not to his wife, right. yeah. The, um, the different generations of gay life, like... Mm -hmm. um, at what point did you become, you know, an observer of that? Because, I mean, you depict it really well, those the sort of generational differences, as well as the AIDS and post-AIDS and then the, you know, the much older side of things. You know, when did that become, when did you take notice, I guess? I guess, yeah, as I said, I, I was sexually active from very young, and I mean yeah. early teens. And so I probably just began absorbing, for lack of a better word. Um I was just observing the way things really ran, you know. I mean, I you know, one of the things one of the things is like if you turn on the TV on Sunday and you would see a preacher, inevitably a Baptist preacher is a tubby, queenie, effeminate guy <laughs> who probably gets off eating desserts. Yeah. And they always did it at my church, you know, it's like we have these covered dish dinners after Sunday service and you know the preacher was generally tubby and and the women were just feeding him sweets like well you don't need to have sex kind of thing yeah <laughs> well it's uh, when we saw bernie that movie with uh, uh jack black is the choir uh -huh. in guy texas who, yeah. you know, who, and the you know the closeted nature of, of his thing my wife who's from louisiana also had a oh, yeah yeah we, we sort of know that that guy you know oh, we, we all, we all have those guy. guys in, we in all the church that and that was yeah. you know Bless his heart. <laughs> no, he's, he's trying, you know, to... to yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, and there's all there's already a kind of like mm, strange Southern thing where there's a kind of delicacy, a gentility, but it's not every man. Hmm. But then he might be suspect because he's not like the Dick's winger or gets out of the truck, or as they now say, vehicle. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I I just I just watched people for the longest time, and I was having sex, and you know, like if 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 you're rushing away from the mall bathroom after sex, was there a big age gap in those days for you? Oh, were you all over the place in terms of who the partners were? Yeah, okay. but you know, those say you know now you can have what you want. You just get on an app, but I don't do that. I, I actually do not do hookup apps. I'm not interested in them. I'm very different that way. Because I, because I like to be physically there. Also, um, well, yeah. it's not just that. It's like yeah. I like to know someone. I like to meet someone and talk to someone, and not on a phone and not mm -hmm. a chat. Because half the time, from all the guys I've dated or fooled around with, they just drop off suddenly. Mm -hmm. They have an orgasm. They're gone. Yeah. Screen wipe. So, <laughs> um, I don't even remember what I was. Just, oh yeah, what I was going to say is that. We used to get, we used to take what we could get. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to say that, you know, you young people today, but that, we, you know, it, yeah. this, you, would, you would say to yourself, not because of AIDS, this might be my last chance for sex hmm. because it seemed that rare. Like, oh my gosh, I'm in a bathroom stall at the library and yeah. this might never <laughs> I, I will say, silly. before yeah. we, we started recording, we talked about my, my um, friendship with Samuel Delaney and uh -huh. me uh, uh -huh. getting exposed to that gay life. I should point out that I went to Tulane uh, for one semester down in New Orleans uh, before I went up to um, uh, school in Western Massachusetts. And um, the men's bathrooms in the library, uh, first time I'd ever seen the hole. In, the glory hole. Yes, in the stalls and had literally no idea what that was for. Yeah. And then a uh, queer pal of mine on the, the dorm floor pointed yeah. out that uh, apparently, in, according to some like gay guide to America, <laughs> that floor in Tulane's library is one of the great gay hookup places of all time. Like, interesting to know. Okay. And that you have a guide for all this is also <laughs> interesting to me. That's, that's is a whole thing behind I have that. A, I have a gay friend who went to Tulane. He's from New Orleans who probably, yeah. I could ask Partook. about that. Right, yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so your, your, your partner, your wife? Wife, yeah. Is from where in Louisiana? Uh, a town called Des Almonds. It's uh, Des about, Almonds. yeah, the Germans, uh, right. the Alamans. Um, it's about 35, 40 minutes from New Orleans, mm -hmm. south and west in the bayou. Yeah, so, I've heard of it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so we go down there once or twice a year. And, oh, and, yeah. It's heaven. I mean, the south really gets on my nerve 
really big time since I got away from it. But I was in New Orleans over the weekend, and you just you, yeah, we, get, we get into the city definitely. Every we're like, let's borrow the car and go into the city right, now right, and, and just right. you know get away a little bit. So yeah, the just the beauty of the of the like <laughs> relaxedness. I was you know I was promoting supposedly pro- proposing my um, promoting my book, but they didn't have my book because it's the big lazy. Yes. Well, there's a, <laughs> so a that, that Popeye's food chain has uh, a slogan, Louisiana fast. <laughs> and it's like, well, I'm not sure you've ever been to Louisiana. because You can't really right, attach right, that right. word to anything that happens. Down there. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Exactly. <laughs> Unless it's fast as in you're not eating, which also does not happen in Louisiana. So. Mm, right, right. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, let me ask. I've always felt that New Orleans is somehow not exactly the South. It goes sort of beyond that in yeah, terms yeah. of its Europeanness and, and everything yeah, yeah. else. Florida, where you grew up, yeah. South or Florida? Is is it its own state of mind compared to what Americans consider the South? Hey. And are you Florida man, as we know from all those news reports? So. Uh, I, I'm, I'm Florida man throws Gator Florida. at the drive through, you know, things yeah, like right, that. Right. I'm Florida man ish. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, it's so funny you say that because <clears throat> about 15 years ago, I thought, I want to write some personal essays about growing up in Florida called South, question mark. And you just said South. Yeah, that's what I... I um, it because it like is it's... a question. But yeah. but my reasons, the jacket copy, you always have to think about the jacket copy because that's important to try to sell the book to a publisher. The jacket copy would say that Jacksonville, Florida, where I'm from, gave us Leonard Skinner. Yeah. So, and, uh, and they grew up there. Yeah. The, so that's something. Yeah, so there's that. Um, James Weldon Johnson is from there. He taught uh, what we used to call junior high there, and uh, he and his brother wrote the song "Lift Every Voice and Sing." Is that what it's the NAACP anthem? Okay. Uh, uh, Marjorie Cannon Rawlings, you know, uh, Cross Creek. She wasn't Southern, but those people, those crackers. I mean. And I think, and they were very early in joining the Confederacy. So we could say South-ish, like we South-ish. say Jewish. Right, that might right. be, you know, right. that's not exactly the South, but it's South. They did have plantations, yeah. you know, indigo plantations and, mm-hmm. and of course, sugar. Um, my, my thing about Key West is that, and I was thinking a lot about Key West when I was in New Orleans, when I... F- five paragraphs ago when I started talking about it. <laughs> and uh, I'm full of digressions. I apologize. No, no, no. It's mine. Yeah. Um, it's on me. Is it, My thing about Key West is it is a southern town with bohemian values. Mm-hmm. Kind of like New Orleans. Let's just say New Orleans is much bigger and far more cosmopolitan because of the Europeanness and everything. But New Orleans is still southern because it's, you know, lazy. Yeah. <laughs> and there are, there are um, hot yeah, and certain schisms in terms of class, race, et cetera. That, yes. that, yeah. oh, Although yes. that characterizes all of America. As, yeah, yeah, as we yeah. Know it, so. And you still get down to Key West annually? Yeah, I was, we, I was there yeah. all of January. Ed came down for a little bit because uh, a friend of his moved here from, from Europe. So uh, he was spending time with him. But uh, I was there all of January. I mean, I really, really do not want to miss it every year. And... I really do. A lot of the book was written at that place that I fictionalize. The Fantasy House? Yeah. A lot of it was written last year there. People were asking me for things. Uh, I just sit at the bar and I write. Okay. Uh, and it's next to a pool. It's out. It's outdoors. Writing longhand or computer? On a computer. Okay. Does it strike people as weird or anything? that, Or is there a fear that, you know... He's writing about us, given the anonymity or no, because I'm in a towel, so of course it's not weird. (laughs) (laughs) I'm not sure what the weirdest thing about it would be is that uh, no, I don't. And people, you know, will talk to me and and they'll say, "Well, what are you writing?" And uh, yeah, I just wouldn't miss it for the world. I mean, there's a freedom there, a bohemianism that, particularly at that one place. That is, I couldn't live without it in this part of my life. I lived with it in Paris, and I've lived in New York, and those two places are probably the, mo- the closest I've gotten to this, but 
in Key West, and this is part of it, I said I don't use the apps, you don't have to use the hookup apps because mm-hmm. you meet people and you talk to them in this, in this place. Yeah. And you talk and you have sex yeah. <laughs> in the pool, in the hot tub, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it's generally just a, a compound and mm-hmm. people know it's there. You yeah. Yeah. rent a room or admission fee, et cetera. And, and I don't stay there because yeah. it's too dang expensive, mm-hmm. way too expensive. But um, you get a, you can get a, like a season pass and you get to go there. You can be there 24 seven if you want to. Mm-hmm. Um, but you can eat and go to the bar Without, yeah, but is it like a strip club thing where it's like, you know, wings that you really shouldn't be eating? Because no, you're the food's out a strip terrific. Club? Oh, good, okay. Good. The food is yeah. terrific. Yeah. And um, and everything's clean. It's not sleazy like mm-hmm. you would think, like in Orlando or Fort Lauderdale. <laughs> <laughs> so Florida, Florida, but not Florida. Right, <laughs> right, right, right. Florida? South? Mm-hmm. Uh, no, no, it's... Uh, there, there's a reason it's expensive. The infrastructure is clean mm-hmm. and good. And the service is great, and um, and the workers are like all from Eastern and Central Europe. And you portray them as, or at least in the book, they're described as being straight and basically there. Basically, as I they candy. are. Yeah. yeah, they are straight. They just they 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 come there, they fall off the grid, and they come on a, like a, a tourist or a student visa, and they fall off the grid, or they go through the legitimate channels. And um, it's kind of an education for me because when um, my book was being copy edited, I had the most beautiful experience with the copy editor. My editor was one of the best on the planet, Ruth Greenstein. The copy editor said, well, we don't use the phrase, I don't even remember the phrase, this department became ICE. I always thought ICE was like a, was like a, an extremely aggressive thing, but that whole concern of dealing with oh, the, the, enforcing, the, yeah, the, the is ICE, CBP, the the Customs and Border Protection. Yes, guys. and it changed. Yeah. Then yeah. I and I I went on Wikipedia, and sure enough, it's ICE, ICE, ICE. ICE. Yeah. I mean, I mean, just what that's about, you know. I really love to be there, and I, and I. A writer is an observer, and that's that's what you get to do there. You can sit at the bar and listen to conversations, or have a conversation, or anything else that yeah. you could do. And a com- it's a compound, yes. In general, in life, because you're not always down there, are you able to tune out other <laughs> as a car uh, other people's voices? Do you find yourself compulsively as a writer? Yeah. Do you find yourself compulsively just listening to people? I wear you? earplugs. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Or if I'm doing something like um, editing something light or answering some questions like doing a, a email interview, I will listen to music with, with earphones. Yeah. Music with words or without words? With words. Okay. Pop music. I'm like, I, I don't do classical music. or Oh, just instrumental. So I, I find it impossible yeah. to do much reading or writing with anything vocal going well, on. Well, that's because you're not... Drinking wine, that's what I do. That's a, I, I, I put booze like six or seven years ago, and I, I, well, I'm more productive than everybody else. I'm much less fun, and that's that's really a trade off. But the other downside I've is. I've noticed there's like 5,000 people you've interviewed. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I tell people that really the only major downside of this is that the rest of you grow more boring with every goddamn minute that goes by. But, but other than that, it's been a great experience for me so far. <laughs> I'm not bragging. It's just, you know what? I had to do something at some point to get rid of the inhibition because I've been writing since I was 12 and I didn't publish my first book till I was 49 and it was very inhibited and I was trying to write novels and they, they weren't very good. Why do you think, why do you think you're, are, do you consider yourself a short story guy primarily given that your first two books are short yeah. story collections yeah. or is it just a, you know, the novels there, I just haven't quite cracked it. I am sort of writing a novel. I'm sort of writing two. I'm not sure which one I'm going to settle on. I think what I like about the short story is that I've already had many people who read it in, in, in galleys and are starting to read it in the, in the final version. They've read it. And people will say to me, have you read uh, 
Blue Sky, Dead Person, a novel of 700 pages. Well, I'm reading that now. Okay, well, let me know when you finish because I want to know what you think. Yeah. They never finish. We're not doing that. We're doing series drama. That's right. most of it. I'm not watching TV because the TV's not in my room and I don't like to watch things on my laptop. Right. But I really don't read that much right now because I'm so frustrated with what's going on in the world and particularly in the White House. But a short story is something that you can read. Yeah. Or in my case, you can write. Yeah. And just keeping all that in your head otherwise in terms of trying to build a... a I mean, these stories do overlap yeah. or, or intertwine as you, you... That was an innovation for me. Yeah. When I started, when I wrote those three in January, the first three are the shortest, uh, January 2018... Yeah, they lured me in. I thought, oh, okay, the whole thing's going to be these like six or seven page stories, and all of a sudden, 40, 50 pages go by. Right. And, yeah. So. That was the idea. It was a, a month before I left Key West, I said to myself, I could do a whole book of these because I have some old ones, and I could find a publisher, small gay press. There's one, say, in Arkansas. They do nice little books. And I said, I can do a whole book of these, and I can make Key West a world, you know. Now in, in creative writing classes, they, they refer to something called world building. Yeah. You know, like it's hair, all about hair. making IP so you can sell something to Netflix. That's, that's ultimately, I'm sorry. To, I'm so. waiting for Netflix. I'm yeah. waiting. Hello, Netflix, please call. Money, please. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> because if you, if you, if you create a, a, the illusion or a, you, you suggest that these are all related, I mean, well, for instance, I, I was on a panel with Andrew Holleran last weekend in New Orleans. And the panel is called Size Does Matter, the short story. <laughs> and um, we're talking about, in my opinion, some of the very best shorts, uh, some of the very best films are made from short stories, if not from original scripts. Because basically a film is a, a stretched out short story. And I try to put in my stories enough to um, suggest that other things are happening. And that might be the screenwriter's job. But for instance... Brokeback Mountain was a short story. Mm -hmm. I remember it came out uh, on my birthday in 19, I believe, 97 or 8. And I remember reading it, and there was sex in it and everything, and I thought, this would make a great movie. This will never be a movie. Yeah. But what Larry McMurtry and his uh, partner, Diana Sama, I think her name is, did was they, they created those wife characters. So maybe it had more influence on me than I even thought because the wife characters were fleshed out. Really, it's most of the time it's just those two on horses and in motel rooms, mm -hmm. the story itself. And it's not a long story. Yeah. It's maybe eight or 9,000 words. But once you start to look outside of what somebody else sees, you know, of the same situation, yeah, yeah. You, you start finding other characters. Right. So, um, did you have a favorite character outside of the one who seems to be somewhat based on you, although I'm sure you, you find yourself reflected in various figures in the book. Um, mm, I have a favorite any, anyone you would want to see or imagine further you know, telling their story? Mm. You know, I, I remember talking to my friend Jeff, who did the author photo of me. He also works as a bartender, but he's also a writer, and he's a very good writer. Years ago, I said, oh, I'm writing a novel about such and such. Oh, it's, he said, it's wish fulfillment. So sometimes part of what I'm doing and when I'm writing is creating a fantasy for myself. What if that happened? What if I got to be a 50-year-old alcoholic who owned property in Key West and didn't have to really worry about making my living because I had a stash of money, you know? Yeah. Um, I think the, main, the character I like is Key West. Yeah. Key West is a character. I, I will tell, as far as the imagining thing goes uh bruce j friedman's memoir uh lucky bruce he tells one of his key uh ways of writing short stories was just the what if you yeah. know something happens in his life and he says what, what if, if this happened instead exactly his great speculative one, fiction in our, in our world. yeah well yeah. it doesn't have to you know have the the, the sf bent he has right. the um but for me it's speculative. Yeah, yeah that's and it all that's ultimately what we do mm -hmm. uh, he had the story of being in an indian restaurant once uh, early 70s, and a pimp comes in with a, a prostitute, and they sit at the next table, and they're looking at the menu, and the pimp starts to 
realize he doesn't know Indian food and has no idea what to order. And Bruce leans over and tells him, you know, oh, you know, I always like getting this. So the guy orders two of those for him and the, the, the girl. The girl leaves for the bathroom. Pimp turns to Bruce and says, thanks so much, man. She's with another pimp, and I'm trying to, to win her over to my yeah, stable. My stable. Ah, and if I, if like I flaked Asia. out on that menu, though, right. I would have lost face, and she yeah. would have thought it was not. So you saved me on this one, man. Thanks so much. No problem, no problem. And that's, that's the extent of the exchange. I give you a discount. No, Bruce goes home, though, and he comes up with a story of maybe they trade, you know, he gives him his information or something, mm -hmm. and maybe that pimp gets busted. Mm -hmm. What if he gets busted and his one phone call is to that professor, that writer, uh, with, hey, man, I'm about to go in the joint. I need you to run my my stable while I'm in for, for six months. Yeah, that's and the rest great, of the story yeah. is him that's debating funny. whether to do yeah, that. Yeah. It ends up getting made into Dr. Detroit, this terrible Dan Aykroyd movie. Oh, my God. They took it, 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 the, the short story just ends with the professor finally deciding to pick up the phone and call and say yes. The movie, they let's make it the, the whole everything that comes after. Bruce had figured out that, you know, the real tension is what's inside this guy's mind as he's deciding whether or not to take a pimp up on his offer and run his stable. Oh, my gosh. Um, I didn't know that's what Dr. Detroit was about. Yeah, I that's, didn't that's, see it. that's it where it comes so from. But, uh, it looked awful. I'm not a snob, but it looked awful. No, no, it looks terrible. <laughs> um, and Dan Aykroyd, as Howard Stern once put it, probably reads his scripts by Braille. You know, he, <laughs> he just was like, you know, it's like there's no reason to turn up that movie. I'm so. an improv. I don't care. Yeah. Uh, but it was just one of those things where Bruce, this ha happened in Bruce's life. He said, what if? You know, what if something else happens? And that's, you know, the leap that he makes in this case. Mm -hmm. um, did you, well, had you thought of ever living in Key West? Or is it the affordability thing is something that would drive it's, you completely it's insane? completely unaffordable. Yeah. I, in my darkest hours when I was not becoming a writer or I was slowly becoming a writer, publishing a story once every two or three years, while in my relationship with Ed, living here, we've lived in this apartment 20 years, I would say... I would get very frustrated with life, the fact that I couldn't finish a novel, and I would say, I would almost announce, I'm moving to Key West, I'm going to be a waiter again, I've been a waiter many times, or I'm going to be a host, or I'm going to do this or that, and it's a fantasy. Part of that, part of the thinking that I'm not going to ever go back is the worry that I would actually not live there. But I think the book takes the place of having lived there. Mm -hmm. If I can, if if I can convince some people, probably people who don't actually live there, if I can convince them that my Key West exists, then it's almost as good as having lived there. And this, and then I can move to New Orleans. Yeah, see, that's, that's second <laughs> right. best. Um, has anyone you fictionalized into the book? read the book or given you any any comment afterwards besides ed which is a separate tangent because you sort of have a fictional i have a i this. have a friend a very um we were very very good friends who is actually i split into two different characters that i don't talk to anymore and um he hasn't read it because the book hasn't come out mm -hmm. um but this is the this is the this is the world we're living in the, the rage that created the book, a lot of it has to do... I broke up with my family over the election. That's probably part yeah. of the, you know. So just two or three... Yeah, two months before was the election, before I started those new stories. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, there, there are people based on... I think the ones that I, I'm... Least concerned about, but most curious about are the people that I don't talk to anymore, mm -hmm. who um, started spreading BS about Hillary Clinton and said things. I, I don't care; it's my vote. You know, yeah. but very careless attitude that we are now trying to make up for. Um, Ed's a character, but he was a character in Little Reef. Yeah. Uh, there's there's a uh, really there's a really cute guy who's from from around here that we, we're friends with and he runs a small magazine and he published something in mine. I was crazy about him and I wrote a section of one of the stories to him in second person mm -hmm. about him yeah. about how my feelings about him and then he's not in the rest of the story. He's in the middle of the story and then he's not in there. And I did it. He already knew that I was crazy about him, but I, it is a love letter. My writing is not 
architectural. My writing is not um, Freitag pyramid. I don't worry about structure. To me, structure is tension and the way you displace tensions. So I will change point of view and I will change tense when I want to. Will I do that always? I'm not sure. But I'm, I'm, I don't have that. I don't rigidity. believe. I don't yeah. believe in that. Yeah. And, and in and fact, it flows well enough. It, it was a little bit of getting used to, but not uh, any. Uh -huh. I don't know what the hell he's talking about. Sort right. of way, not right. the way. Uh, yeah, I have with certain authors. I'm like, I, I don't know why you're doing this, and this isn't making. You know, I, I can't figure out who I'm reading mm -hmm. right now. So, you know, at no point did I feel that with. Uh, oh, good. With this, I'm so. glad to hear that. But uh, I'm when I finally relaxed about it was when I couldn't get my writing together and, and, and get a book published. I couldn't even get an agent. I don't even have a literary agent. Um, what happened was I was like, you know what? The ending of The Great Gatsby never worked. I don't think the ending of Revolutionary Road works. I love Richard Yates. He changed my writing about 10 or 15 years ago when I started reading him. Richard Yates is one of the best writers this country ever produced. But Revolutionary Road is not his best book. By far. He's big into the architecture thing, but he relaxed a little bit after Revolutionary Road. Uh, you know, it's a spoiler, but, you know, I don't believe that she tried to give herself an abortion and died. I mean, she's a middle-class woman with children, and she probably knew the risks. Mm -hmm. And I just don't believe it happened. And I don't even know what happened in the between the two cars and the Great Gatsby. It's like, why don't you just have a realistic ending, like... Uh, Nick has to just like stop seeing her. Yeah. <laughs> why, is, why does everybody have to get shot? <laughs> you know, like a grand drama. <laughs> I know. Yeah, but it's a it's a it's an allegiance to a classical idea of what storytelling is that I don't subscribe to. Hmm. Yeah, when did you start sussing that out for yourself? What were the the influences that you had outside mm. of Yates? And uh, mm. as you mentioned Cheever in the past, but yeah, Cheever. Um, Tom Jones. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I generally think of this this obsession with that as a straight white male thing. But Tom Jones had such freedom when he wrote. When I started reading him, I read he, he, he. There are three books, and I think there's a new one they put out of the stuff that the old and the new before he died. I, I mean, after he died, they put it out. But uh, what he wrote after the last. This is the uh, the pugilist at rest. Yes, guy, right? exactly. Yeah. Not the, uh, it's not unusual. Tom right, Jones. right. Yeah. <laughs> yes, the undulation. Um, he will write about, you know, a, a drug addicted doctor who goes to Africa because of uh, some health crisis or whatever that's going on in that country. And it's more about voice. To me, it's about voice. So I think what started happening was uh, 10 years ago, I would find writers that would create voice and um, Richard Yates is still concerned as I said about structure but he's so funny and and withering and actually self-withering self-deprecating you can tell that the character based on him he knows is a dick there's always a character based on him in every single yeah. novel um, but I think the watershed was reading Joy Williams mm -hmm. who uh you don't know why she's going where she's going. You don't know where she got at the end. And you don't care. It's about the voice, the unusual voice. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I'm going to unplug that. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know how many of your listeners are going to know Joy Williams, um, but they need to know her if they care about very interesting voice-driven uh, voice fiction. Um, I'll, I'll start by saying that She's the daughter and the granddaughter of Congregationalist ministers. She's from New England. And that's, a, that's, that's the most normal about her because um, she definitely has a concern, a, a concern with Christianity. Um, is, it, is it about evil? I'm not sure. I, I'm agnostic. But um, she... Um, you. She's constantly destabilizing, not just the atmosphere, but the very sentences she's writing. And um, what happened was in 2004, I, I went birthday shopping for myself, and there was a book called Honored Guests uh, in hardcover on the shelf, that Three Lives. And I read the first sentence, 
And I just got chills. I'm like, who? I mean, I, I knew her. I had met her. I just hadn't read her. Hmm. I know her from Key West. So for me, she is Key West. Sometimes she writes about it, but she doesn't necessarily call it that. She's very Florida. She moved there after college, was married, uh, and ended up in Key West with her husband at the time, uh, Russ Tills, the Esquire fiction editor. They met at Iowa. She got her MFA at Iowa. Um, she started publishing very young. For me, that 24 is very young. Mostly known for short stories, but has published, I think, four novels. And she only gets odder, in some ways better. But when she brought out her collected stories a few years ago, um, The Visiting Privilege, it's called, uh, suddenly everybody won. She had been a Paris Review kind of writer. Suddenly, the New Yorker started publishing. So every once in a while, the New Yorker brings out a story of hers, and it's always an event. Mm -hmm. And it's transformed many writer friends of mine. And I've been teaching in Rome in the summer at a university called John Cabot University, and I always have to introduce like, two or three stories by her to the workshop to get everybody to just relax. You know, it's like, let your, let your personality come out. It's about your voice, you know. And what is your voice? Let's go ahead and find your voice. And, and she doesn't answer her own questions. You, you, you read the story and you're like, what do I do now? Yeah. What do I do now? What is going on? What precisely is going on? Mm -hmm. Uh, and they're everyday people, you know, but you don't, know, it, it's a, actually, it's a little like, I have to say this, sorry, not an insulting way. It's a little like sitcoms. Do you know how, when you watch a sitcom, it's like, wait, do these characters have jobs? <laughs> Yeah. Jobs only get in the way of you finding out who the characters are. Yes, there's great writing about jobs. And yeah, work. there's workplace comedy. Yeah, but, studs, yeah. circle, and all that stuff. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, yeah, trying to understand people through what they do. That's uh, well, yeah. I would just um, it's the things they say, and they don't. It, it doesn't always add up. Hmm. But now she's, uh, you know, she is. She's just part. Of, the closest people are always comparing her to Flannery O'Connor because of that moral universe. Mm -hmm. And I started reading it and I read everything by her the way I did Richard Yates. And I said, I can do this. I can do this. When you talk about teaching those those students about finding a voice, was that your your instance? Or had you already sort of understood the voice you were writing in? Oh, sometimes I'm writing in a fake Joy Williams voice. Yeah. Well, I just um, mean finding your own through the example of her, her, yes. her work. Yes. Um, sometimes you're laughing and you don't know why you're laughing. And sometimes you're... She never makes me cry. That's not a thing with her. I never feel quite mm, unaccountably tragic. You know, the tragedy is right there on the, on the page. It's like... Uh, well, this person clearly is marked somehow. Mm -hmm. um, she's funny. The main thing is she's funny. And to me, ri fiction writing is entertainment. Poetry is entertainment. I'm doing something that's like the alternative to Netflix. Although, again, if Netflix wants to call, I take the call. <laughs> yeah. But it's... I want you to read a story every night before you go to bed. So I, I've got a lot of unpublished stories as well as some uncollected stories. And I, I want to entertain you, but I have to write about sex too. It's got to be in there. And she, she read it. She's, she's quoted on, on the book. Joey read it. She doesn't really write about sex, but she might, she might make a funny wry remark about somebody's penis being in a, um, Banana hammock or something like that, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Have but tried, she's not ashamed. Have you tried writing scripts at all? I have. Yeah. I have. In fact, um, with uh, the person that I wrote that's, that love letter to, mm -hmm. uh, we were writing a graphic novel version of a boys' own story, Ed's novel. Mm -hmm. We've written the tags. We're looking for the illustrator now. I 
Got and lots that, of connections in the comics world. I can, I can. Okay, you know, awesome. Yeah, so. And the and the um, the idea is, it's like a script. It's like a storyboard for a script. Yeah, yeah. Comics writing is is a unique thing. Sometimes it's the interpretation of what the artist does with it. Other times yeah. the script is so yep. tightly focused. There's no room for deviation. Yep. So yeah. when I was when I was in high school, uh, I was I was uh, smitten by ordinary people, the film ordinary people, and I'd gone through some things with my family. And I wrote a full-length script that was basically a, a, a lower middle class rip off of ordinary people, and I submitted it to a local contest at a university, and I won. I won first place for a script. It was a full-length script, 111 pages or something, and I got a scholarship to the local university. It was a trap, though, because that meant I had to live at home. <laughs> you should never live at home when you go to college. Yeah. But um, that was my first script. And at that time, you had, um, my inspiration was probably Woody Allen and people like that, writing about their, their lives. And at the time, remember at Union Square, you would go and you could buy scripts? Yeah, I remember the old movie scripts and things you, you could pick up from the uh I remember buying, going dealers. and buying actually published scripts because they would still do that. Now you yeah. just download them. But you go to the bookstore and you get a published script. I have this the, is the actual script. The the double of my favorite Coen Brothers movie, and one of my favorite all-time movies, if not the all-time, Miller's Crossing. Mine too. And uh, Barton Fink. They publish as a, uh, uh, both scripts right. together. But um, right. And then you see the areas where they threw things out from the script in yes. the final cut, and you realize and that's that all made it perfect. <laughs> you know, everything they cut would have been extraneous. And, right, yeah. right. Yeah. Um, yeah, giant Miller's Crossing fan. I, I, I don't even make apologies for it. <laughs> that, that totally absurd Albert Finney machine gun yeah, thing. It's like, how much ammo do you have? <laughs> Although the, the great Albert Finney discovery I made uh, very recently in that movie. Do you remember when uh, Tom Gabriel Byrne goes into the ladies' room and, and you know, scare all the women go filing out and he confronts Marsha Gay Harden and she slows oh, him? Yeah. At the, when he first breaks in, the women all scream there's a very tall maid who goes running out it's albert finney in drag um, oh yeah, yeah. If, if next time you watch miller's crossing freeze it when he's like out of my way ladies you know that that sort of thing there's this you know maid gesticulating wildly but if you freeze frame you'll see albert finney wanted to come into work that day <laughs> in the scenes, so he just, you know had him dress wanted to have fun <laughs> yeah. man i love that guy he is wonderful yeah, yeah. Absolutely. um well, we talk about fictionalizing people. The um, my preliminary impressions of you all came from reading a chapter in Ed's most recent essay collection, right? And I realize now that's probably a totally inaccurate uh, set of impressions based on probably yeah. Uh, <laughs> his conversational style is far more disruptive than conciliatory. Is, is one of the lines in there? But um, yeah. Do you have any issues about being either rendered in his stuff or misrendered or fictionalized? No, I'm an American. I'm a whore. I'm okay. A, I want attention. <laughs> the attention, publicity. however you get it. I need the attention and publicity, and I, I still need a literary agent, so, yeah. <laughs> he also points that out, that you weren't able to get an agent, uh, <laughs> yeah. even with a, a good yeah, first book. Now, now it's shtick. It's pure shtick at this yeah. point. <laughs> you have to Michael like Carroll, get a bullet point. Michael <laughs> Carroll, you know. Uh, he does make the comment that you work harder at your craft than anyone I know, he says. It's not true. Yeah, see, that was a thing. I, I kind of figured maybe he was making up this, this, I did at this, one point. this fake Michael, and, and that was... You know. he's, remembering, uh, he's remembering when I would torture myself over two paragraphs a day. You know, I, I, I wrote him a fan letter. I was in the Peace Corps in the Czech Republic. I wrote him a fan letter. He was in Paris. And six months later, I moved to Paris, and he gave me my own room in the apartment, and I, I worked on a manual typewriter, and I would just struggle over a paragraph. And in those days, Macs were not a, as reliable as no. they are now. Like, suddenly, a page would just disappear, right. that kind of stuff. Um, I used to kill myself over it. Part of it was reading those writers and telling you about Tom Jones and Joy Williams and uh, Richard Yates and realizing, no, just don't write a historical novel set in Central Europe, because I lived in Central Europe, I wanted to write about, you know, like how Protestantism in part got its start in Bohemia, in the Austrian, you know, all that <laughs> stuff. It's like, and I could never find where I fit in. Yeah. So once I found out that it's all right just to write about myself, I'm not going to knock myself out. I want you to enjoy it. If I'm not enjoying it, 
I don't think you're going to enjoy it. That's my theory. Are you regretful about the story that got cut? You, you mentioned that one of the older stories got, got booted from where Star did I, Wars. Where did I, oh, I said this early in the yeah, interview. Yeah. No, I, I saw Ruth's point. Ruth is a very, very smart, astute, seasoned professional. I saw her point. It just seemed kind of repetitious. But that story, Head Art, is the only other one that was previously published. So it's in an anthology. Okay. So you and feel like it's out there in the world. It's out there. Do you remember the vibe when you, you first saw your first collection, like in print or on a bookstore shelf? Uh, Not to make you regretful or, or sad or anything about the direction of your life or anything like that. Jesus, you have this wistful look on your face right now. <laughs> um, it was just the most wonderful thing because the book is really beautiful. They did. It was a hardcover. It still is not in, in paperback. It had actual cloth board, cloth bound boards. Yeah. It was a beautiful book. And I was, you know, I was just totally moved. It's like, uh, it was like Sally Field. Yes, you really like me. Um, I remember feeling just more relaxed. And I remember a very sweet, uh, wonderful friend of mine gave me a book party and is giving me my next one. Um, and I remember walking into, it's like, this party's for me, for a book that I wrote. And I was very proud of it. And I just haven't really suffered as much, except romantically, as before Little Reef came out. I mean, I'm not going... But I'm, I'm lucky to do what I do. Mm -hmm. I don't make any money off of it, but I'm lucky that somebody wants to publish me. And the vibe is, I made it. I did have a lot of help. And my parents did help me a lot, but I have made it now without the people that I don't have use for anymore. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a sensation, a vibe of semi-independence. Yeah. As much as one can have as a writer where you depend on right. the whole industrial base. <laughs> yeah. Now let me ask, you mentioned um, Paris, Czech Republic, mm -hmm. uh, etc. Yemen. Yeah, but, yeah but before. Um, did you have the traveling bug when you were young? Or oh, yeah. Or this a, I need to get away from my family yes. as far from Jacksonville as humanly possible? Yes. My very first novel I wrote when I was 12 was called A Year in the Life, and it was about a kid my age who was an actor who uh, gets a job in a movie, and the movie puts the character all over Europe. So that gave me a chance to dream on parts of Europe that I really wanted to see. I don't even know what the story was, except they were making a movie. Yeah. I don't know where the manuscript is. You know, I don't know. But um, all I ever wanted to do was travel. And right now, I, I inherited an itty-bitty bit of cash so I could get out of debt from a friend. And, and I was like, oh, now I'm going to take that trip to Amsterdam by myself. And discover things that I've never done before yeah. involving mushrooms or whatever, <laughs> you know, and now it's all gone into promoting this, <laughs> this new book, <laughs> but I'm dying to spend a lot of time in Northern Europe because I, I mostly know Southern Europe and I'm dying to, you know, go to Polynesia, you know, white sand, blue water, uh, Montreal. I love Montreal. I've been there before, but I want to go by myself for like a week. Mm -hmm. And it is part of wanting to escape the world that I grew up in. I still have really good friends back home and they're wonderful people, but it's fucking Baptist. It is motherfucking goddamn Baptist. <laughs> yeah. And fuck that shit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I ain't. Yeah. So. <laughs> so not a Jaguars fan is what you're saying. I'm just kidding. Not uh, <laughs> not hugely. Uh, yeah. Are they still there? <laughs> I'm. You know, people an, always would say, yeah. uh, "Michael, what about the Jaguars?" I'm like, "I'm gay. We're getting away from coaches yeah. and team sports and bullies." I kind of figured that's all. Time yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it was uh, on that. I that could tell you knew that TV show, the the Good Place, where uh, there's a 
very, very dumb character who's from Jacksonville who's obsessed with the <gasps> quarterback Blake Bortles. And oh, that's hilarious. Because the guy has such a ridiculous name. Right. Certain Bortles. writers on the staff who weren't football fans thought the name Blake Bortles was made up by some, one of the other writers before <gasps> discovering this is actually a human being who, who plays for a, an NFL right. team. And he probably went to some Christian high school. Yeah, well, you know. <laughs> He's a good stand-up guy. I know. know. I'm sure he is. Uh, And he's got a charity. Yeah. Foundation. Foundation, I mean. Uh, But as as influences go, do you find yourself yourself changing as a writer? Do you find yourself still influenced Mm. um, when you read something now? Is there a sense of, holy crap, that's... That's a, I think that's an excellent question. Do I... um, Are you able to have your, your socks knocked off by... A piece of fiction nowadays. I'm, I, you know, I'm, I, I'm more excited about like Lana Del Rey than yeah. any, any piece of fiction right now. But okay. uh, That's cool. <laughs> you know, she's like, she, she I, you notice there's a lot of drama queen kind of writing in there, and yeah. it's actually for fun. Yeah. And that's what I get from her. It's like I was revising. I was at a friend's apartment because they were in Key West. It's a friend's apartment a block away. Good friend. And it was that hot, hot part of August that was hideous last summer, revising this book and just walking around in my underwear, sweating and stuff, and listening to Lana Del Rey over and over because that was my that was my way of like justifying what I was doing, but also keeping going. But like, encapsulating make some more the... coffee and because yeah. I had to do it fast and I did two versions of it in that one apartment in a month, two revisions. And inspiration now, it's not TV. I'm waiting to get, I, I, I'm dating right now. I'm married, but I'm also dating. And I'm waiting to have somebody to just sit and watch things with. So there's, it's not, there's not, I don't go to movies anymore because I, there's no one to sit with in the dark, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, Oh, so this isn't like the Times Square thing. I'm, I'm making another Samuel Delaney reference. <laughs> Doo doo. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, I'm excited by younger writers. I, I, uh, and I, and I do want to settle down and, and and keep reading and stuff. I find it so hard until we get rid of that person in the White House. I find it so hard to concentrate on anything but the news, as well as the canned outrage. And I will admit that's part of it. Um, but this is very serious stuff. Um, I think this culture produces untold numbers of good writers. And part of it is that a lot of these writers come from other countries and they go to a writing school, go to Iowa or Columbia, and they write really good books. Can I name any right now? No. Of because, course not. Yeah. <laughs> Otessa Moshveg, is that her name? Otessa Moshveg? Yeah, I've heard, I've heard it pronounced, and that sounds close. So, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. People like that. Um, I want to be influenced the way when I was influenced by Joy Williams and uh, Richard Yates and Tom Jones, and then before that, I don't compete with, with Ed, my husband. I don't compete with him at all. There's no need to. He's an intellectual. I'm not an intellectual, I'm an entertainer. Mm-hmm. Uh, he mentions you absolutely detesting high culture in that same chapter in the uh, uh, book. Hates opera, hates ballet, etc. So. Well, he overdoes it. I don't hate it. It's again, I, I don't want to go sit there and attempt to be entertained for four hundred dollars, um, unless I'm enjoying it and sharing it with somebody that you know. I joked about this with Sandy McClatchy the one time we recorded uh-huh. uh, that he got Chip Kid to sit through the ring cycle twice. Oh, Lord. And I said, wow, that's the equivalent to one San Diego Comic Con. You know, <laughs> <and, and laughs> his face, like his jaw just dropped, like that I made a comment like that. Yeah, he was just, yeah. no, no, I, I don't go to Chip's things. I'm like, uh, mm-hmm. we know, darling. Yeah. 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 yeah, well, actually, Sandy was one of the first great supporters of my published kind of stories in my first book at, in the AO Review. And I'm eternally grateful for him, and I'm nothing like him except that, you know, I like uh, wine and chat and jokes. But he was a PhD at Yale, and he and James Merrill, mm-hmm. all the people that Ed knew from the 70s, are all about high culture. But I'd rather keep learning languages and having sex. Well, that's, <laughs> that's my high culture. I'm here. It's a, uh, uh, a thing that uh, Fran Lebowitz brings up in the, the documentary they, that Scorsese did on right. her, where 
every gay generation had older men who would shepherd exactly. younger guys with, with culture. And yeah, then yeah. with AIDS, you end up losing that older generation. Yeah. And so there aren't guys to take you along as a young man and, no, you need to see uh, you know, Balanchine, you need to see the ballet, etc. Balanchine, um, I'm glad you said that yeah. because that's, that was Ed's yeah. great, great love in the, in the 70s. But to that point, uh, guys much younger than me don't read. My readers are women and it's older gay men. Who's your audience? The women and older gay men? Oh, women are so good to me. Yeah? They always were. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I feel so safe around you. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yes. Don't worry. You're very safe, darling. Unless a bully comes along. Yeah. But <laughs> then I'm out of here. But um, uh, what was the question? Uh, ideal reader. Ideal uh, reader. Yeah. Ideal reader is... Um, Don't say Oprah. Yeah. No, 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 no. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, it's an executive for Netflix. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. thing. No, it's um, it's uh, someone who likes fiction and doesn't need it to be a kind of circumscribed thing. Doesn't have to be a, a genre like sci-fi or something. Um, I would like to have more gay readers and talk to them, but so many gay men now are so priggish, very yes, priggish. Oh yeah, oh yeah. You know, it's funny. Uh, I think you probably read that written interview. Um, yeah, it sounded like it was a text-based. Yes, it was. Uh, it, was it was, and and he said he he made two very weird points, and one of them is, you know, like about uh, about the sexual content of my stories, and how shocking it is that the characters just meet and have sex. And I was like, well, really? have you heard of Grinder? I know this person. I know yeah. that this person is on hookup apps. Um, I, the, the difference is the delivery system. You meet the person, and I don't. I'm not saying he's a prig. I think he was worried about what readers were going to say. But I mean, why worry about them? Because most of, most of the gay readers aren't reading. You know, they're reading Harry Potter still. Mm -hmm. They're reading genre stuff. Uh, I would like it if more gay men read. But the reason in the '70s. We had to read books about our lives because there was nothing. There was no TV. There was no film about it. Yeah. And um, I'm not. I'm not here to teach. I wouldn't want to pretend that my writing could teach somebody. But I would like to. I would like them. I would like younger gay readers to read and then talk to them about it. Mm -hmm. Not as a seduction, but just like talk about these things. But it's also easier to have a conversation with you about it than yeah. with younger gay men because they don't read. All I do, you know, again, you have the, you know, someone to read with and have sex, but you know, in this case, my version of sex is, you know, right. two of us sitting for a conversation right, right, right. naked, which nobody knows. But that, that's okay. <laughs> yes. And, um, this time I didn't use a towel. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah the underwear, the heat, the blah, blah, blah. <laughs> the sweat. Yeah. Right. Naked. <laughs> Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not even like self-conscious about my belly because I'm behind the table with the tablecloth. Yeah, nobody can see it. <laughs> nobody can see that anyway. So, <laughs> but, do you, but do you have any readings or events that are tied into queer or gay literary? Or mm. Are there gay literary mm, events? Yeah, there are. To, uh, yeah. I'm very lucky. Uh, sometimes people write me, and it makes me feel very famous when I'm not. But there's a thing. There was a. There is a, an event at Club Coming on Monday, and Club Coming was started by Alan Cumming. And I can never remember the name of the series, but it's four writers once a month uh, for two hours at Club Coming, and uh, I don't I don't expect that Alan Cumming, the owner, will be there. But um, but if he is, and you want to tell him about the podcast, I'd love to have him on. My wife would come and and drool the whole time. Okay, so, yeah, you know. I will tell him. I will tell him. <laughs> Uh, and, and you know, like we'll all get very excited by a Scottish accent. Yeah. I was at I was at the Saints and Sinners um, oh, thing yeah. Yeah. in New Orleans last weekend. Uh, gonna go to Chicago with Aaron H Hamburger, another male, another gay. Again, I, I need more male guests more all males. the time. That's it. <laughs> <Right. laughs> Preferably white, just right. so I can keep this demographic as as awful yeah. as possible. So. We're gonna we're yeah. gonna do a reading on Pride Week. Yeah. So there's that. Mm, I'm going to the Stonewall Museum of Fort Lauderdale uh, next week, uh, and I'm, and semi-gay. A few days later, I'll be at the Key West Public Library. 
to. Yes, yeah, so I wonder if there's a Key West literary scene at all, or if it's just going to be sort there of. There is cross, definitely so. one, but not this time of year. Yeah. Um, the literary seminar in Key West is in, always in January. Mm -hmm. um, I I love doing that. I I felt weird last week in Oxford, Mississippi, at the conference for the book when I looked up and saw all the straight couples, retired straight couples. And I was cutting out the sex, as I said. But um, but then you know, just have this wonderful conversation sometimes with someone you didn't expect to yeah. have a conversation. I mean, to me, what the book does, again, we mentioned world building, but it, it, you know, it explores a universe that, in all likelihood, a lot of readers know nothing about. Or we've got our stereotype of, you know, oh, Key West, you know. Uh, but this creates a more human world mm -hmm. there. Um, with populated with with people who extend in time, you know, right? That's uh, I think a pretty amazing achievement. Thank you. Ed is always saying Key West isn't gay anymore, but that's because he's not hanging out at quote fantasy house. Right. Oh, actually, <laughs> last question. Within that that chapter where Ed writes about you, he mentions you're editing his work, um, just you know, post strokes and everything else, and, and mm -hmm. cleaning up all his, his tangled prose. Mm -hmm. Does doing that? impact or uh, affect your writing at all has editing his stuff yeah it's made me more relaxed about say revision mm -hmm. like when i was sweating it out in that apartment last august um the last story in the book i just immediately cut out several pages like i don't know where i was going with this it was right at the end i'm like man where's the end let's do it yeah and yes uh it it, it influences me to just relax about the writing as well as the editing. And I'm very proud to have been involved in that. That's pro I'm probably actually almost as proud of doing that kind of thing as writing. You know, like I, I, we have had an impact in each other's lives. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, you know, when I was 20 years old, he was, he was the person I wanted to be. Long before I met him, ten years before I met him. So you look back, it's like only ten years. It felt like a hundred before yeah. I met him. But yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, when I read when I read a Boys on Story or States of Desire's uh, gay travel log, I was like, who is this absolute angelic genius and you know that kind of thing? And I still feel that way. I think the main the main thing is you have to have a legitimate job when you're becoming a writer. And that was just as legitimate a job as any I ever had. Uh, better than, more fun than being a waiter or whatever, or a janitor, which I did too. Um, Editor slash amanuensis. A man, yeah. chauffeur. Yeah. Yes. I drove him, <laughs> I drove him from Memphis to Oxford, Mississippi. Uh, we, we used to do a lot of uh, vacation house things where involving driving. And... I'm just as proud of that, but I am not possessive and jealous. He he needs to have his uh, his relationships, mm -hmm. um, which is some another thing I learned from him. Was that from the outset in your relationship? Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I figured, but you know, I never know. You never know what goes on behind anybody's doors, really. So right. Yeah. You know the it. It just was naturally that way. I mean, from the moment I met him, I just knew that's the way it was going to be. Mm -hmm. But it's really hard to try to get something going with somebody else because they're hesitant. Actually, that's a, a weird last question to ask. The, the Ed in the pages versus the one you met. Mm -hmm. How did that differ for you? Was there a sense of this isn't the same guy or this is the guy who's... I think that's sort of the what's miraculous about Edmund White is he's the same person on the page. Even if mm -hmm. he's writing uh, in the voice of Francis Trollope. And as he said, Francis Trollope, he just imagined his mother. His mother is very, <laughs> she's, yeah. she's, you know, she's a bit brainier sounding and so on. But, you know, he is the most companionable narrator, even if it's third person or whatever. Yeah. He's the same person. It's, it's, uh, it's this constantly springing intelligence and, and kindness, empathy. He he's not writing as though he knows more than you do. 
if he if he if he is writing about something he thinks you might not know about, he's sort of excusing himself and laughing at himself, saying, um, uh, "You already know this, but you know, yeah. <laughs> finding a way to get you the information." Yeah, yeah. Or, or and he's help you. he's uh, and he's he's never tedious to listen to. He, he when he writes, he'll say, "Can I read you a few pages?" He reads everything to me as he's writing it. And it's never te- it's never once tedious. He read his whole last novel. He read every book to me aloud. And it's not tedious to go back over. Sometimes when I was helping edit after the strokes, I believe it was Inside of Pearl. Um the Paris book. Yeah. I was I was scared of tearing the fine tissue if I wanted to like rearrange a paragraph or something like that, I kind of lost that fear, but it would take me six weeks to do a full edit of a manuscript because I didn't, I didn't want to mess with his voice. Yeah. Another thing is we both published, we, we collaborated on a story that was in a book called New Jersey Noir that was edited by Joyce Carol Oates. And I, I came behind him. He wrote the initial version and I came behind him and, and did lots of revision, and I just decided, well, I'm going to think of it as pastiche. I'm going to write it in his voice mm-hmm. because it was very skeletal when you presented it to me. Yes, I wondered the. I always wonder with the multi artist in the same genre or the same form household. Usually, it's married cartoonists, and I wonder if they like are deliberately unfunny around each other because they're saving their best gags for the New Yorker and, and don't want the other one to steal them. But, you know. I wonder, but I think they're always like, oh, that's good. Let's use that. Yeah. Don't you think so? Well, uh, yeah, but they're, they're, they're cartooning individually. Oh, so I Conceivably, see, I one is I not going to say something see, funny around right. her because she might present that instead. So, yeah. Oh, you know that you know that, that, that really wonderful movie by Nicole Holof Center, Friends with Money, I think it's called? Heard about it, haven't seen it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think it's great. Jennifer Aniston is so funny and so good. But there's a couple in it who are screenwriters, and they sit across from each other writing a screenplay. And uh, that's how their marriage breaks up, because they're saying, I don't think she would say that. This is a thing when <laughs> the, there was a terrible review of Ann Beattie today, and Ann is a friend of ours. And they were basically, she was, the critic was basically saying, and we always hate this as writers, when they say, I don't think they would say that. I don't think they would say that. A friend of mine wrote a whole novel. She wouldn't do that. It's like, it's fiction. She did. Yeah. She, quote, did do it. But um, their marriage falls apart because she wouldn't say that. Why? Why not? <laughs> and the, the next thing you know, uh, she's criticizing his bad breath. <laughs> Everything is hiding something else. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Michael, thanks so much for coming on. Thank you, Gil. It's so fun. Thanks. And that was Michael Carroll. His new book is Stella Maris and Other Key West Stories from Turtle Point Press. I enjoyed it a bunch. Um, It evoked a world I don't know much about, uh, both geographically and culturally. And Michael does a great job bringing it to life and exploring the the common elements of of human desire, not just for sex, but for love and and friendship and and legacy. but he also explores the unique aspects of queer life and of that Key West life um, that, that's just fascinating to me. So Stella Maris, it's S-T-E-L-L-A-M-A-R-I-S is the name of the collection. Now, Michael's on Twitter and Instagram as M Carol N Y, which is M-C-A-R-R-O-L-L-N-Y. Um, As mentioned, he publicizes the book via Instagram and posts lots of neat pics from his life. And after we wrapped, I asked Michael, so, who you been reading? And if you want to hear his answer to that and get some extra conversation, you'll need to become a supporter of the Virtual Memories Show so you can get access to our quarterly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet. I swear the first quarter 2019 episode will be up soon, but once again, the weekend got away from me. Uh, Fourth quarter 2018 episode features book recommendations and extra conversation with Eddie Campbell, Nora Krug, Jason Lutz, Summer Pierre, David Small, Mark Derry, Michael Gerber, Angela Himsel, K. 
Kathy B. Graham, Shahar Pinsker, and Bill Cardalopoulos. You can support the Virtual Memory Show via patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod. I've got all sorts of goals and goodies in place for patrons, including that podcast, a patron-only blog, handwritten show notes for every episode, my secret project, and more. So go to patreon.com slash vmspod and support the art of fine conversation. Now, I recorded this one at Michael and Edmund's home in New York City while I was in town for a business conference. Uh, so there's literally no podcast-related expenses on this one since work was paying for my travel, hotel, etc. Still, if you want to help defray some of the costs of the virtual memory show, like web hosting, travel, equipment, coffee, or just toss me some money because you think the show is worth it, then visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and make a one-time or recurring donation. The special thanks go out to Nick Bartosik, Michael Hacker, Michael Janicek, Fred Kish, Jonathan Kranz, Jack Lescamella, Teresa Lewis, Stephen Nadler, Jim Ottaviani, Payne Prophet, Dmitry Samarov, Stephen Solomon, Craig P. Steffen, Greg Tanner, Ford Thomas, and Garrett Zecker for going over and above in their support of the Virtual Memories show. We have the full list of show supporters at chimeraobscura.com slash vm. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth, used with permission from the artist. Check out my episode with Hal from the summer of 2018 to learn more about his art and his music, and listen to his music at soundcloud.com slash Mayforth. And that's M-A-Y, the number four, T-H. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with Frederick Tutton, author of the fantastic new memoir, My Young Life. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memory Show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube, Spotify, and tunein.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell your friends, tell people on social media, and go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memory Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. It all goes to helping us build a bigger audience. You've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth. Keep reading, keep making art, and keep the conversation going. 